Uh, thank you so much. My name is Tokozani Chimbe. Um, uh, I'm from Malawi. I work for the Malawi Communications Regulatory Authority. Firstly, I would like to commend Erika for the wonderful presentation, as well as UK for making a lot of strides in this particular area. Uh, I would like to ask a question regarding the uh, ecosystem pillar. I know that uh, when it comes to cybersecurity, women are always um, part of the, one of the vulnerable groups that need to have specific uh, deliberate interventions. Is there anything the UK has done in this regard? We would like to learn from, best, because you cited that best practices, is cyber security is borderless, and we can't do away from best practices. So what are some of the things that the UK has done in the ecosystem pillar to incorporate a women or not to leave women behind? Thank you, madam. Is there another, another question on this side? No? Yes, please. Okay, uh, my name is Dr. Emma Otieno from uh, Communications Authority of Kenya, that is a regulatory authority in Kenya. Um, you spoke about the issues of uh, building strong partnerships, strong partnerships in this space of the cybersecurity. We have, of course, uh, different um, ecosystems in our various jurisdictions. So I'd just like to understand how the UK is succeeding in terms of managing the cybersecurity when it comes to that aspect of uh, building uh, strong partnerships and what examples we can take home. Thank you. I'm not understanding that question, sorry. Did you say with partnerships? Uh, building partnerships, yeah. Actually, the aspect of building partnerships in fighting the cyber threat. Okay. Yeah, how are you doing it? Thank okay. you. Thank you. Okay. Um, so in terms of uh, what we're doing with women, I mean, for us, it's not... Um, uh, just about the fact that every part of society has a different interface with the cybersecurity risk. But in the UK, we perceive that there, is, there are not enough women actually um, in the cyber sector. Uh, and so we're looking at women and we're looking at diversity actually in the cyber sector. What we see in having uh, more women and more diverse communities uh, actually working in cybersecurity helps us to develop a much stronger response because part of what we need to do is almost think ourselves into the heads of the people who are perpetrating these crimes. And the more we have a cultural mix and the more we have a gender mix, the cleverer we're going to be in terms of understanding uh, what's going on here. So for us, it's really important that we attract um, women into the sector. It's also really important that we attract women and people from diverse communities into the sector because, as I said, we think we've got a 14,000 person gap every year. We think we produce about 3,000 uh, new cyber um, uh, security professionals each year. There's about 17,000 jobs out there. Um, so we've got a big gap. And what we have in the terms of the cyber sector is something that perhaps is not encouraging lots of different people in. And one of, that, one of those reasons we think is about what the cyber sector looks like, so whether you're attracted because you can see other women in it or you can see other people from diverse communities. And then the other is, um, as I mentioned, the National uh, Cyber Security Council have um, uh, been trying to make sure that the pathways are really clear. I mean, interestingly, when we've spoken to young people, particularly young women, uh, they are very ambitious young women and they have a very clear career goal. I'm sure that young men too have the same thing uh, going on for them. Uh, but um, what happens then is young women say, well, I, don't, I can't see my way through here. So I'm not going to actually uh, invest in this kind of education because I don't know where I'm going with it. Um, and we're trying to remedy that. So for us, that's really uh, important. Uh, in terms of partnership, um, we work uh, on uh, elements like um, secure connected places in partnership with local authorities. So we're, we're doing that with local government. Um, 
We have this program, which is called the UK C3, which is a clusters program. So we recognize that if you, in places and spaces, bring together uh, a number of organizations who are working in that place and get them to work together, that you can share best practice. Um, but what we are also doing is making um, a partnership of all of those different places and saying, can you in the Northeast tell the people in the Southwest what you're doing and vice versa? So using partnerships to share knowledge, I think has been very successful uh, in the UK and the UK C3, this clusters partnership, which we only set up last year, has been um, very successful and very popular in terms of understanding uh, what best practice is and then transferring that knowledge. So quite important for us. Um, we also, I think really mostly over the last uh, 18 months and particularly obviously picking up since we've been able to get out of the UK and do some traveling, are really building partnerships with other na nations. And so we know that if we uh, look at particular issues, so for example, We've just brought out a code of practice around uh, application security, app security. We know that if we do that alone as the UK, then the people who are delivering apps, they're not just delivering applications for the UK, they're delivering applications for the whole of the community and the whole of the globe. And so we've done a lot of work with international partners, particularly with the US, who obviously have another massive market. Uh, making sure that when they are approaching app developers and the online platforms where you can buy your applications, that we're all doing that in the same way. And the more that we can do that across the whole of the globe, the stronger uh, our community will be in terms of um, uh, making sure that we're not uh, acceding to cyber threat. Thank you, Madam. Are there other questions? Yes, at the, from you, please. And then. The person behind you <laughs> there. I'll take the two questions first. Uh, morning. Uh, morning, morning. Marango Letsikinyane from Lesotho. Um, do you have a cyber incident respond a strategy and teams? We normally call it set. Do you have that at a national level, or is it at a organizational level? Because you, we've seen that other countries don't have it at national level. Is the UK, or do the UK have it nationally? And if yes, who is running the, the set? Next person, just behind you. Hello, I am Mudupe, Mudupe from Lesotho. Uh, my question relates to the international pillar. So I believe that, uh, okay, let me say, John, in his uh, presentation, he talked about collaboration on, secu cyber, on security. So my question was, can you, can you cite maybe a, a case study where you have a working relationship with any country, whether it's Africa, uh, Europe, or anywhere else, where you have started working on, on, on this issue. Thank you. Um, on the cyber incident response strategy, yes, we do have one. It's not in my remit, uh, because in the UK, we have um, an agency called the National Cyber Security Center. It's about six years old now. It was uh, set up under the last cyber strategy. Um, they are a very well-respected um, uh, organization internationally. Um, and uh, they are the people who respond to all of the large incidents. Um, so I work, we work very closely with them. The reason why we work very closely with them is because in, um, in DCIT, what we're looking at is what is the nature of these incidents? How is the nature of these incidents changing? So therefore, what is the threat? And therefore, what is the policy that we need to be putting in place for those kinds of threats? And over the time that I've been in post, which uh, is about, well, three years now, um, we have 
worked with the National Cybersecurity Centre and we have developed policies, for example, around connected places. That is a really good example of where they had local authorities coming to them saying, we're buying this tech, we're putting it in our place, um, but we're not really very confident that we understand the cybersecurity risk that comes with this tech. And what happens then is that the National Cybersecurity Centre comes to us and says, can you with your policy teams look into this risk and try to help us understand what we should do next? And then we've worked with the National Cybersecurity Centre to use their technical expertise to set up a code of practice for uh, connected places, which is now in place. And then it comes back to my team, who are doing some practical work with local authorities to implement that code of practice. So that's how we work with them. Uh, I would highly recommend that if you don't know anything about them, you get to know a little bit more about them. They are very active internationally. Uh, they're very well respected, and they do um, do uh, a lot of um, work internationally, like I do, to ensure that you know what they're doing is uh, aligned with what everybody else is doing as well globally. Um, on the international pillar, in terms of working relationships. So we have a number of working relationships across the globe. We do work very closely with our European partners. And I think that, um, obviously, um, over the last few years, that uh, working that we've done with our European partners has gone through a little bit of a rocky road, but we're definitely back on track now um, and doing a lot of work, in particular with France and Germany which I think is really helpful for us. We also work very closely with Singapore and the US. And we, um, we think that, obviously, the US is a massive market. So if we can make sure, as I said, around app security, that we're aligned with them in terms of what they're putting in place, that's really, really helpful. And then Singapore is looking Easter, easterly for us, but they are a wonderful bridge. Um, and so we also work with them um, and the kinds of places where we've had particular uh, success in that kind of work is around consumer IoT, so the connectable, connected wearables that we have and the things like, uh, you know, the smart speakers and your uh, doorbells. We put together in the UK a code of practice around how we felt those things should be dealt with in the market. We have just actually put in place some legislation that says that all of those things have to have certain levels of security in place, um, mostly around password, uh, update to firmware, those kinds of things. And in Singapore, they have a labeling scheme that is based on the same code of practice. So if you're selling something into the UK market or you're selling something into the Singaporean market, then you have to have the same levels in terms of uh, standards of security. That's really helpful for us. That's been very successful. Just one last question, and then we'll move to the Two. next session. Two. There's one question there, and then the, the SJ has a question. We have to take the floor, and then we close the session. You have the floor, gentlemen. Thank you, Thank you very much, and uh, very good morning. My name is Rafael. Uh, I'm from Zimbabwe. My question relates to identity in digital um, cybersecurity and, of course, the transformation that we all want to see. I would want to understand um, your approach or how far you've gone and maybe share your experiences when it comes to social platforms that are generally used by uh, users where most of us are on WhatsApp. And also, if you had to take into consideration that um, our approach in terms of cybersecurity was to prevent the attack. But as you can, as we all know, that um, attacks are being perpetrated by people, say, in your, they can be perpetrated for someone in Europe and coming back, say, for example, to Africa. So cyber has no boundaries. And laws are not the same. We don't have same same laws across the the globe. What is your approach? Because I'm seeing a problem where someone can perpetrate a cybersecurity issue wherever they are, and they will never be caught. 
we are also saying that uh, the social media that is being used, identity is not known. People use pseudonyms, use fake names, and those platforms do allow such registration. So with identity being critical in the, in the, in the um, enforcement of uh, cyber security, how then do we approach that? Are you working with uh, the, the, the Gmails of this world, the WhatsApps of this world, so that we can enhance uh, cyber security? That, that, that is my question. Thank you very much. I think what you're doing beautifully is introducing the next panel. <laughs> exactly, that's just what so, I... So, <laughs> um, in the UK, we have a piece of work which is around online harms, and you've got somebody, I think, who's coming to speak to you next about that, so I'm not going to steal their thunder. Uh, and then we're also doing some work in my team on digital identity, and I know Caroline is joining your next panel, too, to talk about that in more detail. So we are doing this kind of thing uh, in terms of trying to be much more um, uh, systematic and um, having some controls around how we're using identity um, and also uh, very aware of the dangers in terms of harm around online um, platforms. But uh, again, I'm going to let I'm going to let the next uh, uh, group of experts take you through that. But really good questions. Thank you, Madam. The SJ will want to take the floor, please. Academia has an important role to play in supporting the industry um, and uh, by producing the right types of grad graduates and so on. You spoke about the programs and the absence of clear career pathways. My question is, has the UK government uh, engaged the academic academia to talk about what the needs are and to nudge them in this I don't want to say nudge them, but, but to get that support, that is absolutely necessary. Yes, uh, yes to both, uh, absolutely. And so we really saw a problem uh, around this kind of systematic understanding of what a cybersecurity professional could be um, uh, as a part of the first cybersecurity strategy work. So where we were looking at skills, really recognizing that actually people were spending a lot of money on uh, cybersecurity training, but that training wasn't delivering them the right things. Uh, that in uh, academia, you know, not necessarily very clear to students who are going purchasing uh, degrees exactly what's part of that degree and whether that actually really puts them in a position to get a cybersecurity role later. And actually, on the other side, that businesses weren't really understanding what it is that they need to buy and particularly for small businesses obviously that's really quite problematic when you know you've only got a limited amount of money to spend on a cyber security uh, function and you need to make sure you're bringing in the right the right people so we are engaging that's why we've set up the national cyber security council it's really important for us they're engaging with business they're engaging with professional bodies and they're engaging with academia to make sure that we can, in, in, in some ways, kind of build a lexicon that helps us understand what cybersecurity professionals are and can be. I mean, I think the really interesting thing is that actually there are so many different um, uh, aspects to a cybersecurity training and the kind of things that you need inside your business. So, yes, you need technicians, uh, but you also need people with creativity because you know, they've got to be thinking about, well, who's coming in and how they're going to attack us. Sometimes uh, those kinds of cyber criminals, remember, it's a, it's a business uh, and they're very creative. So you need some creative people on your side, but you also need people who understand the governance of a business and can persuade senior managers to spend money on cybersecurity. Because the big issue that we have with cybersecurity in terms of business is that quite often it's the elephant in the room. You don't really understand how much you need to be spending on cybersecurity or how important it might be to have a cybersecurity expert in your business because cybersecurity is a risk. It's not, a definite, it's not something that's definitely going to happen. Um, and so what you need also in your cybersecurity profession is somebody who can speak to the business and make sure that they can uh, persuade senior managers that they should invest. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we're running uh, out of time, so I'll okay. exceptionally give you the floor. Be brief. Thank you very much.
working? Yes. Okay, thank you very much. I think the last point has been addressed. You have addressed it. It's, it uh, relates to challenges of funding. Uh, because mostly in Africa, we have got the problem of funding. Would you know how much, I know the, uh, the UK economy is a big economy, but do you know how much you spend on cyber security uh, issues? Oh, uh, on, good on question. Annual basis. I don't, actually, off the top of my head. I will go away and find out, though. I mean, I think that will, we do... These are the kinds of things that are really difficult to, um, to quantify anyway. We try and quantify how much... And we said, I think it was 5.5 .5 trillion across the whole globe in terms of, we think, cybersecurity incidents. But, for example, understanding the cost of a cybersecurity incident is com complicated. So we run a, a survey every year and we ask how many people have been hit by a cybersecurity incident, how much did it cost them? But quite often we think there are loads of hid hidden costs that they don't uh, necessarily attribute. So, for example, if you're the Royal Mail and you've just had a cybersecurity incident, which they have, how many people now will be saying, OK, well, I'm going to send my parcel by DHL because that's going to be potentially a safer way of getting my parcel sent uh, you know if, if um, the Royal Mail have had this incident but on the on the flip side it's very difficult for us to actually quantify how much people are uh, spending on cybersecurity um, on cybersecurity itself and I don't have that number with me but I, I'm looking at Ella at the back and we'll take that question away and see if we can come back to you with something that is about uh, ballpark thank you uh, I will now call up uh all the panelists who will be presenting, they will all come up to the, to the stage, and then we'll make their presentations. We'll try to cut them as short as possible to catch up with time. So, I'm going. You, Thank I you very much. Like to this moment.